carry on. So today we're going to look at the yoga practices, specifically yoga therapy, that is going to be helpful for gynecological problems. So looking at the most common problems that can be there, so premenstrual syndrome or premenstrual tension is very, very common. Um, so that is something that you can get a lot of benefits from uh, through different yoga practices. Dysmenorrhea, also very common, painful periods. Uh, are again, practices that can be helpful during menstruation and then practices that can be done throughout the rest of the month. Um, to prevent this problem. Amenorrhea is also common, so not having a period at all. It's very common in the yoga world, unfortunately, because there's a lot of uh, extremes in yoga practices and also extremes in diet uh, leading to uh, these issues. Um, then we've got amenorrhagia, so heavy periods. Again, more common in women who are having problems like fibroids. Uh, irregular menstruation, very common, <laughs> um, especially for those who have a very irregular lifestyle, um, women who are traveling a lot, working shifts, uh, all of this can be affecting. Then looking at menarche and menopause, so they're not problems as such, it's just the beginning and end of um, menstruation, but there can be practices that are helpful at the time of menarche and there's also practices uh, that a woman can do when she's perimenopausal. So before the cessation of her periods uh, that can just make it a little bit easier for that transition. Then infertility is a big problem these days. We know that it's growing and we've got a whole lecture on that. We've got a prolapse of the uterus. Endometriosis, very, very common, and leukorrhea. So looking at the different causes of these problems, now of course they do vary to some extent, um, but a lot of the causes are very similar and they can just present differently in different women. So looking at stress and anxiety, we know that these are the most common causes for a lot of different conditions and diseases. But every woman knows that if she is very stressed, her cycle changes. So it's very, very closely linked. So we do need to make sure that we are going to focus on relieving of stress and anxiety. Then looking at uh, obesity, this is again growing and this is leading to a lot of different problems. Um, there's a lot of links with PCOD related to obesity, but also infertility and many other problems. Then looking at disturbed lifestyle. So as I was mentioning with the regular cycles, so many women are not following a regular lifestyle. They might get up early one morning, late the next. Same with going to bed, eating at all different times, working different shifts, you know, sometimes working nights, sometimes the day. So this can all be affecting a cycle. Then uh, diet, of course, is going to be having a huge factor. And many women know, even if they don't generally follow a very good diet, they often know or they've linked that if they change their diet before they get their period, it becomes a little easier to deal with any kind of problems. Uh, in fact, many women have found that just by reducing certain types of food, they don't have as much pain during their periods. Then looking at the disturbed relationships. So this kind of relationships can be with any person. It might be their partner, it might be a parent, it might be a sibling or a friend or a um, child. So these relationships, particularly if the expression isn't there, if there's a lot of suppression of emotions, this can lead to you know, uh, lots of problems related to their reproductive system. Then if there's any kind of imbalance hormonally, and this can be for different prob from different problems, physical problems, emotional problems. There can be weakness in the pelvic region, uh, just general low prana um, can be there. And then also looking at the relationship that she has with her menstrual cycle. A lot of women are not very aware of their cycle. They don't understand when they're going to get a period. They don't understand that they really should be changing things a little throughout their cycle according to what 
they're needing physically and emotionally. So that is something to, to build awareness with. So yeah, moving on a little bit into the menstrual cycle. So a lot of women don't really think about it. They don't want to think about it. Um, they can feel that it's embarrassing. And depending on how one has been raised, they can have different ideas about the menstrual cycle. Some women can feel that it's dirty. Um, some women just don't ever want to think about it and haven't been taught to have any awareness or understanding about their cycle at all. So it is important to look at one's connection and one's relationship with one's cycle. And here you can see that next point, that the cycle is linked with different emotions. Um, but this is mostly the conditionings that we've been raised with. So building the awareness is really important. And that's what I talk about more in one of our other lectures. Then looking at the pituitary. So we know that the pituitary gland is controlling the menstrual cycle. Uh, it's releasing of luteinizing hormone and FSH. And we've got the adrenals, which are helping uh, her deal with different stresses. And the ovaries are also releasing estrogen and progesterone. So lots of different practices to focus on these different hormonal glands. So looking at yoga therapy, there are a lot of different practices. So not only looking at asana, but we've got pranayam, cleansing, bandhas, mudras, meditation, mantras, lifestyle and diet. And we'll go through all of these in more detail. So first looking at the yogic treatment, so what we want to be focusing on. And here, of course, you're going to get a little bit of my, my naturopathy focus. Uh, so here, what we're going to focus on will depend on the condition, but a lot of things are going to be very similar, as we mentioned before. So reducing stress and anxiety is going to be key, okay, as it is with all yoga therapy. Then balancing of the emotions. So if she's feeling any kind of frustration or guilt or anger or fear or anything else that might may be there. Um, and understanding also, and this can take a little bit of time uh, to understand whether one is suppressing it or letting it out or dealing with it. You know, what kind of tools are they using to deal with their different uh, emotions that they're feeling? So looking into that. Improving circulation and prana to the pelvis and also to the pituitary because we also want to make sure that the prana is going to be more balanced. Okay, and so removing any kind of uh, energy blockages that can be there. Then balancing of the hormones, removal of congestion in the pelvis, then correction of the uterus position. So this is, you know, important for prolapse, important for issues of infertility, uh, strengthening the ligaments and muscles around the uterus is also important. Then starting to have a more yogic lifestyle or yogic routine. So here things like getting up on time, going to bed at a good time, eating at regular times of the day, um, trying as much as possible to have good yogic practices that are being done every day. Uh, then increasing awareness of the body and mind, particularly in relation to menstrual, the menstrual cycle. So building up awareness of the cycle, charting the cycle, you know, and there's lots of different things that you can put into a chart to build awareness and understanding. And the last one here, it's a big one, acceptance of our femininity. So this it's especially important for those women who are trying to prove something, for those women who don't want to think about the menstrual cycle at all, that don't want to change anything um, according to how they're feeling. And this, of course, is, is often due to conditioning, being pushed uh, in society. We know that women now have to accept many, many different roles. They have to work very hard on multiple things. They have Many, many women are trying to prove themselves to be as strong as men. So, yes, definitely women are as strong as men. They have different strengths um, to men. But we can also accept, when one can also accept one's femininity as well and embrace it because there is a lot of strength. 
looking at the chakras now. So this will depend, looking at the chakras, you want to understand what ones you need to work on uh, a little bit more, but this will depend on each individual. Uh, here I've written all are important and need to be balanced. Yes, definitely. Uh, looking at Adnya, so Adnya is going to be having an effect on the pituitary, so especially helpful for balancing of the hormones. Then looking at Vishuddhi, so voice and expression. So before I was talking about relationships. So for some women, it can be that they're holding on to something, they're not expressing something, so they might need to work on, on that. Uh, then looking at Anahat, the heart. So on acceptance, acceptance of oneself, acceptance of others. Uh, also um, expression, you know, on the emotional side. Uh, and this is where, you know, the practices of Vaman can really be affecting a woman deeply. If she's been holding on to a lot of things, the practice of Vaman can really shift that suppression. Then uh, Manipur. So to help build up the energy, the prana, um, and make sure that it's getting distributed uh, in a correct way. Uh, but also looking at the adrenals and the way that they're um, helping one to deal with stress. Looking at Swadishtan, which is uh, looking over the reproductive system along with Muladhar. So with Swadishtan, again, looking at relationships, especially with one's partner, about desires, inhibitions. Um, so how one is feeling on that level. And yes, Muladhar, so as I've mentioned already, governing the reproductive system and is the seat of one's primal energy. So a lot of the practices that are focusing on the reproductive system are focusing on Swadishtan and Muladhar. Now, if we're looking at asanas, so we want asanas that are going to be strengthening and toning the reproductive system and the abdominal pelvic area, increasing prana, balancing of the emotions, balancing of hormonal secretions, improving circulation, so blood and nutrients and removing any kind of toxins that might be there, and also removing congestion. So there's lots of different movements that can be done, different types of yogic movements and warm-up practices. So we've got Surya Namaskar, Sun Salutation. This can be helpful if the uterus is in a retroverted position, so where it's kind of going downwards instead of upwards. Uh, and this can be uh, related to infertility where the sperm can't quite reach. Uh, and also Suri Namaskar has a very balancing effect on the pituitary and on, on all the hormones in general. Then we've got the Shakti Bandhas, the Pawan Mukhtasan Series 3. So they help to remove energy blockages, uh, especially in the pelvis uh, and also along the spine. So the Shakti Bandhas focus a lot on reproductive uh, organs, whether it's the female ones or the male ones. Uh, and we go through these in our class. We've got all the Shakti Bandhas that we go through, the pulling the rope, dynamic spinal twist, Chucky Chalan, which is grinding the mill, the Nelka Sun Chalan, rowing the boat. We've got the chopping of the wood, Kashta Takshanasan, Namaskarasan, the salutation pose, Vayanishkasan, the wind releasing pose, um, Kawachalasan, the crow walking, and Udakashanas in the abdominal stretch. So lots of different movements there, focusing on the pelvis and along the spine. Then Shashank Bhujangasan, so the cobra to child, uh, moving in between the two is quite a dynamic practice. We've also got Druta Halasan, which is the Plata forward bend, another quite dynamic uh, movement. And Uttanasana, which is the squatting and rising, which is a little more gentle. And looking at the different types of asanas, and I'll go through this fairly quickly because there's a lot. So, Savrangasana, the shoulder stand of Viparikani, the inverted pose, whichever option is, is possible. So that is going to be strengthening the uterus and all the ligaments around. And this is useful after childbirth because of the possibility of prolapse. Um, but of course, one can't practice it until at least six weeks, uh, and it will also depend on the birth. 
So uh, sarangasana is also helpful to improve circulation to the reproductive system and also for detoxification. Uh, here I've written for irregularities as well and pain prevention. Obviously not to be practiced at the time of menstruation, but the rest of the month. Then we've got Nalkasan, the boat pose. So this is helps to strengthen the ligaments around the uterus. Chakrasan, the wheel pose, has a nice effect on all the secretions of the hormones. Shishasan headstand, so immediately you think of the pituitary gland. Uh, and it can be helpful if there's a lot of premenstrual congestion that is building up. Bhujangasan Cobra Pose, known to be helpful for leukorrhea, also for painful periods, obviously not during the time of menstruation, but the rest of the time. Um, basically, all these classic asanas that we know, uh, all those classic poses are affecting the abdominal area. Um, and that's why they always focused on them, the, the ancient yogis, because they knew that all those classic asanas uh, strengthening those abdominal organs. Also for absent periods. Then looking at Ardha Matsandrasan, the half spinal twist, again another classic, so it helps to relieve congestion and of course improving circulation, all of those things. Titiliasan, the butterfly pose, or Baddha Konasan, helps to open the pelvis. You've got Halasan, the plow, which uh, helps to balance the hormones. Kandarasan, the bridge pose, uh, so again affecting the pelvic organs, also known to be helpful as a prevention of miscarriage and known to help for menstrual uh, problems. Uh, Matsyasan, the fish pose, to improve the prana to the pelvis. We've got Shalabhasan, the locust pose, so that's uh, good for strengthening the pelvic organs, especially for the pelvic floor muscles. And it does create an automatic Sahajoli Mudra. So there's Vajroli Mudra, which is in men, and Sahajoli Mudra is for women, and that is the contraction of the urethra. Uh, so that is helpful with Shalavasan. Then we have Danyarasan, the bow pose, uh, for balancing of the hormones and making the periods more regular also known to be helpful during the perimenopausal phase. And Paschimottanasana. So, you know, all these that I'm saying, they're all classic asanas. The full forward bend. So, again, a strong compression is there onto the lower abdomen and pelvis. We have Supta Vajrasana and also Vajra Matsyasana. It's all going to be affecting the pelvic region. And often those positions are nice to do during menstruation, especially with some supports like bolsters, so it's not going to be as strong. Uh, many, many women can find that they get uh, relief uh, with these asanas. And then we've got Ushrasana, the camel pose, so that is a strong stretch into the pelvis and the lower abdomen. And here you've got another list of other asanas that can be helpful as well. So Adha Chakrasan Half Wheel, Uttanpad Chakrasan, which is um, where one's in supine, raising the legs up and then rotating both the legs in a circle. Ashwini Mudra, uh, the Horse Gesture Pose, Arkana Danyarasan, the Stretched Bow Pose, Sankatasan, the Perfect Pose, uh, Garudasan, the Eagle Pose, Paravata Trikonasan, the inverted triangle, Virasan warrior, Uttanpadasan, the raised leg pose, Patangasan, the kite pose, and Siddhasan, the perfect pose, or uh, Siddha, um, Siddha Yoni Asan, is yeah, another name. And yes, yeah, Sankatasan is not perfect pose, Sankatasan is difficult pose, <laughs> actually. But it, Sankatasan is the preparation for Garudasan eagle. Okay, so we've gone through lots of different asanas that are going to be helpful, uh, but now let's look at pranayam. So bastrika, the practice of bastrika is helpful for removal of toxins and to increase energy. So that's especially helpful for amenorrhea. They often need to build up their prana more uh, and to help for painful periods, but avoiding it during the time of menstruation. Ujjayi, the victorious breath, is going to be very helpful for stress relief, especially for anxiety. Uh, Nadi Shudan is going to 
be helpful for balancing uh, of the energies. It's helpful for balancing of the mind, the thoughts, and it also clears the blockages of prana. Brahmari is very, very healing, has a really great effect on anxiety and stress relief. And Chitalin Sitkari, the cooling breath, uh, helpful for calming um, the mind, for relaxation. Here I've written muscular, but also mental relaxation. And also if there's a lot of menstrual heaviness, if there's a lot of strong flow. Also for women who are going through the perimenopausal time and they're having a lot of like uh, hot flushes, uh, then this can be helpful too for the cooling effect. Then if we look at cleansing techniques, so the practice of neti is very helpful for stress relief and of course it also has an effect on the pituitary gland. Vaman or kunjul is another practice which I just mentioned earlier which can help to relieve uh, suppression of emotions and I've seen it uh, for so many women that they've been, you know, the women who uh, don't like to cry or always hold on to their emotions, always try to, you know, keep a strong face. And then when they practice vaman, you know, everything comes out and they feel relieved. <laughs> so, yeah, things that can be held on. Uh, and also if, if a woman is having a lot of anger issues, vaman can help to release it. Vaman does decrease the pitta as well, as well as the kapha. Uh, then we've got Kapabhati. So Kapabhati, frontal lobe cleansing, uh, is helpful for cleansing of the mind as well as the lungs. Uh, it can help to release the emotions that can be suppressed. And of course, it also energizes uh, the body and mind. Agnisa, Agnisa Doti has a strong effect on the pelvic organs. So it increases the blood flow to the pelvic region, uh, the lower abdomen, the reproductive organs, and it also increases energy. And Lagu Shanga Prakshal and the partial cleanse uh, can be helpful if she's feeling very constipated. Uh, many women do find that they have a lot of pain if they are constipated, and that's why naturally a lot of women do start to have a little bit of diarrhea before they have their period. Um, because of that connection there. So looking at bandhas, so mula bandha, the contraction here of uh, the mulada, the trigger point for mulada chakra. So uh, this is going to be helpful for removal of congestion. It's going to help to strengthen the muscles of the pelvic floor uh, to increase prana and to help control any kind of sexual urges. Then we've got uh, Udiyan Bandha. So Udiyan Bandha helps to tone the pelvic region and especially increase the circulation to the reproductive organs and again, increase energy. And Jalanda Bandha, the throat block is helpful for the thyroid and metabolism. And overall, all three bandhas together with kumbhak is going to help to regulate uh, prana, bring a lot of tranquility, so especially a lot of peace. So it's very helpful for um, high levels of stress and also to regulate the endocrine system. So we can apply the kumbhak into any of those different pranayams that we've already discussed. Then looking at mudras, so the different types of mudras are there, which are going to uh, create the energy in the reproductive system and to stimulate the pelvic nerves and tone the organs. So we talked already about sahajoli mudra, the contraction of the urethra. So that can help to redirect energy, remove unwanted sexual thoughts and also conflicts. Viparitkani uh, can be practiced as a mudra, uh, for its healing effects. Pashini Mudra also, or Karnapedanasana as it's often called, is having quite a strong effect on the pelvic region uh, and improving the circulation to the reproductive organs. Ashwini Mudra, so the horse gesture, uh, is a very helpful practice. Now it can be done in a sitting position or it can be done in Sarangasana. Uh, but if it 
it is often done in Sagrangasan for prolapse and it's much, much more helpful in the inverted position um, for this purpose. And then we've got Yoni Mudra and there's lots of different types of Yoni Mudra. Um, there's a simple version of a Yoni Mudra, there's a little bit more complicated version um, and this is going to be basically stabilizing the energies in the pelvic region and also stimulating them. So that balance of stimulation and stabilization. And more importantly is that connection. So connecting to one's uh, womb space is really important and something that many women haven't really thought about a lot. So then moving on to meditation and mantras. So the practice of Mahamrutunji uh, is going to help with healing and balancing the body and mind. Uh, Gayatri is going to increase energy and also help stabilize the emotions. The Durga mantras or the goddess mantras are also going to be very helpful. They're especially helpful to connect with uh, the feminine side. Uh, the practice of Om, chanting of Om is very, very healing and especially can help to clear any kind of negative emotions that might be coming up. Yoga Nidra, and there's lots of different types of Yoga Nidra that one can do. Um, but especially uh, here I've written, you know, uh, women or girls, you can say, who are having a tough time um, with their menstruation can feel um, very, very negative about it, especially when they're feeling very uncomfortable, or they're having pain or they're feeling embarrassed. Um, there's lots of practices of Yoga Nidra that can help them feel more connected and start to value their cycle. Um, but we can also have yoga nidras for different um, stages of one cycle, uh, especially before menstruation and during menstruation. Yoga nidra can be really good, um, but we can also have yoga nidras just for connecting to one's femininity uh, and also to help with any kind of menstrual problems. And for another meditation, we've got Antamon, which can help the inner silence remove uh, tension, mental tension. But there's lots of different types of meditation that can be practiced. Um, another meditation that I find is especially helpful for women is the practice of gratitude towards one's body and what it does for one. In a really, really huge so looking at lifestyle and diets, as I mentioned briefly, uh, starting to have a better daily routine and a healthy lifestyle. So having more fixed timings of, you know, going to sleep, eating food, when one does a yoga practice and exercise and all of this. Um, here I've written fresh air, you know, making sure that one is accessing um, nice fresh air, hopefully, <laughs> depending where one is, fresh water, um, having regular exercise, but also having regular rest. So especially practices of yoga nidra or long shavasans um, are really, really important. Now looking at food, so now there's always a lot of different opinions uh, related to diet and food, and I'm not going to get into it too much, but um, there has been a lot of links between a diet which is very high protein, which can aggravate um, a woman during the time just before her menstruation and even during her menstruation. So many women do find that if they are cutting down on their meat and dairy, that they find it much, much easier to deal with the effects of PMS. Uh, so that can be on the emotional side and then also during menstruation if they're having a lot of pain, um, if they reduce um, the meat and dairy because that meat and dairy is going to increase that inflammatory response. Also decreasing caffeine, so coffee and tea, um, processed foods, so foods that are going to be increasing the acid uh, instead of having that alkalinity uh, and also sugar though often women do crave sugar at that time and it's often going to be having that really negative effect so making sure to have a whole food diet lots and lots of vegetables um, and as not as least processed as possible here I've written for the time of menstruation to eat potassium rich foods like um, ripe bananas lemon and orange 
foods with lots of iron in. So you've got uh, the different types of nuts like almonds, cashews, figs, beetroot and of course dark green leafy vegetables are really, really important. Uh, the next point is taking time out for ourselves. So this is all about bringing balance in one's life. So having time, whether it's for the yoga practice or yoga nidra or just time where one goes for a walk, does some exercise, does a little shavasan or even just takes up a little hobby, but something that one is doing for themselves instead of just for others. Because especially um, with women, they do a lot of things for other people. They have many, many roles and often they don't look at, the, look at themselves uh, and they don't have a very balanced lifestyle. So making sure that one is having that balance or aiming for that balance. And this last point is a big one, <laughs> again, finding our role in life. Uh, so this again leads to the connection between stress and anxiety because a lot of uh, people are stressed because they don't really know their purpose in life, they don't know their direction or they're not very happy with what's happening in their life, but they don't really know how to change it. So this is not a, a small thing. This can take a long time to really understand one's direction, one's purpose, and even how to go about that. So there's a lot of practices that can help that. The SWAN practice is uh, one of them. Uh, starting to analyze one's life, um, what one really wants uh, in life, and that's where the SWAN is very helpful. But you see it a lot in, in people who are working in a job uh, every day, very long hours, not very happy in their workplace, not happy with the job that they're doing, feeling very unsatisfied. Of course, this is going to be having an effect on their health. So it is important to start to look at how we can feel satisfied and fulfilled and content in life. And there are other techniques that are also going to be helpful for balancing the reproductive system and any kind of problems that can be there. But you do need to have more knowledge about them before you can use them. But the, it's nice to know these different practices because then you can recommend them. Uh, especially if you know someone who is specialising in one of these, you can um, recommend that they go and visit these people. So mud and clay therapy uh, is used. We often use uh, compressors of mud on the abdomen for reproductive problems, especially if there's a lot of heat related issues. Uh, then there's a lot of different herbal medicines that can be used. So we've got Ayurvedic herbal medicines, then a lot of Western herbal medicines are all very helpful uh, for the menstrual cycle. Uh, it is really important to know what you're doing with herbs though, uh, because they all have different effects. So some of them are increasing estrogen, some are est uh, increasing progesterone. You know, you don't want to mess around with them. So you need to make sure that you uh, send them to a herbalist for that. Then water therapy. So this can be warm water where you might put a towel in in warm water and put it on say the lower belly um, you can also use like a hot water bottle uh, it might be that you're using cold water depending on the problem um, but this is something that is practiced in in naturopathy then homeopathics there's lots of different homeopathic remedies which can be used for acute problems or chronic problems energetic medicines um, can be used especially, you know, for different emotions, suppressed emotions, blockages in prana or chakras. So Reiki, pranic healing, there's so many different forms um, that can be practiced. And then we've another form of energetic medicine are the bark flowers or the bush flower essences. So lots and lots of techniques. So lastly, looking at menstruation now, we've had another big lecture about this. So this will just be in, in a, just in summary. So some of the practices during menstruation that can be helpful, Shashankasan, the child's pose. So especially with the knees apart, this can be really, really soothing uh, for a woman who is having pelvic pain or lower back pain. It can be very relieving. 
Um, Madhurasana cat pose is another one and there's a lot of different movements that one can do in the cat pose to get relief from any kind of um, pelvic discomfort or pain that is there just to stretch out the body a little bit more get that movement in uh, breathing in Tadagasana the pond pose so especially for removal of stress and anxiety Mulabandha so Mulabandha is generally practiced uh, the rest of the cycle. We don't do a lot of Mulabandha during the time of menstruation. Um, but for some women who are having a lot of period pain, they might do a small amount of contractions, just contract, release, contract, release, and that can be helpful. But it shouldn't be held for long periods of time. So basically you don't really want to hold it for longer than, say, 30 seconds um, because it is going to redirect the energy in the other direction, which is not what you want at the time of menstruation. Uh, and in fact, if one does hold Mulabandha for a long period of time, then it can actually stop the flow completely. So it's pretty strong. <laughs> so then also making sure that the time of menstruation is a retreat time. So a retreat time as in you know, she puts a little bit of time aside to do something for herself, whether it's a yoga practice or a yoga nidra or having a bath or going for a nice uh, walk in nature, something where she can be with herself because at the time of menstruation, she is going to be a lot more sensitive. She's a lot more intuitive and she can go deeper very fast. So it's, it's a good time to be with oneself. And in fact, she wants to be with herself more. She doesn't want to be as social at that time. So trying to fit in a little bit of time for herself is going to be really, really helpful. And then other kinds of uh, asanas are going to be good to help remove kind of pain or congestion. We've already mentioned Vajrasana Yoga Mudra, also known as Shashankasana. The legs up the wall can be a nice option. Uh, and there's lots of different uh, ways that we can have the legs up the wall. Then forward bending. Uh, with support. So instead of doing a regular Paschimottanasana, you know, having uh, a bolster on the legs or a pillow, so it's going to be a much gentler version can be nice. Or the Ardha Paschimottanasana, uh, Ugrasan is another one. Then butterfly pose. So butterfly can be in a sitting position or against the wall or with the legs kind of up the wall or in supine. Um, basically, the butterfly pose is a classic women's asan, so very nice during menstruation in a supported way. Then we have Supta Vajrasana as well, so in a supported uh, way, that can be really, really nice uh, stretch for the belly. And then the different twists that we can do in a supine position. Again, of course, you want to make sure that they're going to be really gentle. So all of those practices are going to be really helpful. And of course, adding on pranayam and meditation. And the last slide here, looking at menarc and menopause. So menarc, the time when a girl gets her first period. So learning the practices of Surya Namaskar, the sun salutation, Gayatri, Mantra, and simple pranayams like Brahmari and Alternate nostril breathing, Nadi Shudan, are going to be really helpful for her. And they're kind of like a yoga toolkit for life, you know, um, which is going to help maintain a balance in her body. Now, during menopause or, or the perimenopausal time, um, some women can have different types of problems. Most common are the hot flashes, but there can be um, vaginal atrophy, weight gain, dizziness, sleep problems, different emotional disturbances, all of that plus more can be there. So if she's having a regular practice beforehand, then there's going to be less chance that she has these types of problems. Um, but during uh, the perimenopausal time, practicing inverted positions when she's not um, bleeding are going to be important. Uh, and all this classic asana is focusing on the abdominal area, back bends especially, 
um, pranayam, bandhas, meditation, all of this is going to be really, really helpful for her. And also yoga nidra for this transition time, you know, the, ch the change into the next uh, part of one's life. So many practices that are going to be helpful for that perimenopausal time. And overall, you can see that there are lots of different practices that are going to be helpful for women at every stage of their life.